Hi everyone, I'm Cherie. I'm Jean. And, and we're, we're the, the Tiger, Tiger Sisters. Sisters. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about entrepreneurship, our startup life, what it's like, and how it's going as founders. Before we get started, don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe and put all your questions into the comments. We read all we read of them. read every single comment. And so let us know what questions you have or things you want us to follow up on in future episodes. And you see, we usually answer them. Let's get started. Let's bring back roses and thorns. Okay, Jean, why don't you kick us off? What is your rose and your thorn? Okay, so my rose for this week is that we recently went to the Snap Partner Summit, which is the annual uh like conference that snap puts on is it a conference it's a conference yeah it's like a conference for mostly partners and it's where we i say we i don't work there anymore but it's just like mental um where we announce like all of the big things that we've been working on and all of the launches for the year so i've been on the inside before well i've always been on the inside and this is actually the first time that i've gone where i've been a partner instead of being like a team member, a presenter, an like an employee. Um, and so it was just, it was really fun, obviously, to see a lot of my old coworkers. And also like, I am still just really so proud of everything we've built because, you know, I only left earlier this year. Um, so like a lot of the things that we showed were things that I have actively been working on for a really long time. Um, so that was just like, really rewarding yeah. and it was also just it was just really fun to experience it as like the other side of it and like really get to just not be like worried about how things are going and um like experience experiencing it in whole in a totally different way and like just seeing how actually really enjoyable it is yeah. and how much effort they put into um, making it a really good time for the clients. Yeah, you were the partner in the Snap Partner Summit this time. Yeah, um, and then the other really fun part of it was that like, I got to see how well curated the guest list is mm. and how it was really fun. Obviously, there's like tons of like engineers, product managers, like leaders, like people who actually worked on it that I was like connecting with, but then also a lot of the... Um, like creators mm. that are invited, like yeah. on the way over, like the whole experience, like as soon as we get out of our car, we got, went to a shuttle, which was like a five minute shuttle to take us to the venue at Barker Hangar. But like in our shuttle was, um, Lala, a creator named Lala Milan. Yes. Lala Milan. And she has like 4 million like followers across platforms. And she's a huge like lifestyle fashion creator. And we were just like chatting her up because we number one, didn't know who she was because I hadn't seen her content before. She was so nice, like, like so cool. Like was asking us a bunch of questions about yeah. our content, our podcast. It's just very serendipitous. She was just so like funny. Like when you know, when you meet someone and you're like, mm, like we're, you we're have vibing. such a good vibe. Yeah. Like she asked us, she was like, oh, what's the name of your podcast? And we we're like, oh, Tiger Sisters. And she goes, that's hard. And I was like, she gets it. I was like, oh, I love you. I love I you so much. She's good. Um, but yeah, just like meeting like lots of different people and like the energy created, it was just really special. And I have never really like fully appreciated how special yeah. it was until getting to experience it from the other side. Yeah. So that was my rose. Yay. Yay. Um, You're like glowing talking I know. about it. You're like smiling so big right I now. I know. It just feels really like full circle. Oh, it's very nostalgic too, I feel like. Because you yeah. saw a bunch of your coworkers, your former coworkers there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the thorn. Uh-oh. The thorn is that someone forced someone to leave 10 minutes before Rufus de Soul came on. This was your thorn? I thought it was going to be way more dramatic. <laughs> it's dramatic for me oh. because I was excited to see Rufus de Soul. That's actually not true. Else. You were totally fine with leaving. Don't put this on me. So Rufus de Soul, I was like an I was EDM ready. DJ. I was so ready to vibe and party with my friends. Okay. Well, so he played, he was like on at 5.30 at Snap Partner Summit. No, at 4.30. Oh, at 4.30. Approximately at 3.30, I crashed. And I was like, please, like, can we, like, leave? <laughs> like, I was, like, literally about to fall asleep. But then Jean bumped into, like, another two people of her friends. And they started getting talking. And it was, like, an interesting conversation, definitely. And, like, it was nice to be engaged. But, like, 
my battery was like so low that like I needed to leave. But then, you know, we got into another conversation. I felt like a little kid wanting to go home from like a parent's event. You know what I mean? I was like, I don't know why she was so tired. She I've been even networking. Do... Networking is tiring. Yeah, but who are you networking with even? Well, I would like go into these like little circles because like you would say hi to people that you were talking to. Yeah, And yeah. then I'd be like in an offshoot circle, like not in your conversation. Yeah. And like talking to random people who are interesting. But then like, you know when it's sometimes hard to exit a conversation? Yes. So, I got to get better at that. Me too. I really need to get better at that because like I'm also like interested, but I'm also just like, I need to leave. <laughs> You could just be like, so great talking to you. Yeah. I need to run and find my sister. (laughs) Well, we also went to a bunch of talks as well that day. You just know the conference vibes. It's like, it's like pretty tiring. So yeah, Rufus DeSoul, like really well-known EDM DJ performed and we did not get to go because I wanted to leave. I saw it in so many snaps afterwards. It looked sick. Sometimes the concerts and the snaps are better than the actual thing. I will say that out there. sick. Yeah. Next time. Yeah, next time. Don't bring your lame ass little sister. Yeah. Um, sorry for being so cool. Said no one ever. <laughs> mm. okay. Isn't it funny that I'm the lame one in, in this context, only in this context, and then you're the cool one who wanted to stay and party? Oh, I'm always the cool one. Mm-hmm. That's not true. You just haven't, you haven't seen that side of me. That's true. We've never gotten drunk together. We haven't? Never. I actually told some of my friends that and they're like, what? Well, you've just always been so much younger. I know. Not that that's like a criteria for anything, but when I talk to my friends who have like siblings who are closer in age, like they go out together and all of that stuff. We've literally, the only time we've ever been out together was when we were in Las Vegas with our family. I know, but it's because I'm so cool and you just want to go home and go to sleep. That's true. I have to wake up at 6 a.m. to go to my gym classes. Let anyway, me hate me. Anyway, okay, what's your rose and thorn? Okay, my rose. Oh, I have a show and tell. Okay, it's a little bit hard to show. Okay, it's a little bit hard to show because my hands are very full. But as some of you might know, mm-hmm. Jean and I are working on our matcha brand. It's called Sisters Matcha. And it's been something that we've been working on for quite some time now. And it's finally coming together. So Sisters Matcha, I think we're going to dedicate another full episode to like talking about it or like another segment at some other time. But we we have this matcha brand and we've been working on the prototype and... As you can see, these are paper prototypes. I come from an engineering background and like this is something we would do in classes. Like you would create paper prototypes before going forward to like making an actual thing. So reminded me a bit of that, but like- Even for computer engineering? Yeah, well, some of my classes we would do it, especially for my like electrical engineering classes and stuff. You would just like- I didn't know you took electrical engineering. It was one of our like core required classes. It's like the most base level. Wow. Yeah. And um, you just have to do paper prototypes and also for like- my like web design classes you would make paper prototypes and like move things around really mm-hmm. exactly. i didn't know that yeah it was very fun and interactive in that way that's so cool actually so gene and i have a matcha brand it's out for pre-order so make sure you pre-order it is the perfect holiday gift and it's slated to get in right before the holidays so we're hoping like all things going well, like it'll come in November time and then we'll be able to send it off for holiday season. And I'm just so proud because Jean it's and one I, size fits all. It's true. Jean and I, and I'm so proud because Jean and I like have spent so much time on this and on the design iteration and we really, I don't know, it's coming to fruition. And I love like having a physical product, you know, more to come on like why we're creating this and like, you know, what's the plan moving forward because I feel like that did, that deserves its own like yeah you know and there's discussion. a lot of meaning behind the design too yes. seriously um which we don't have to get into now but like everything we did has a reason and it's was like, like super well very thought out. yeah very intentional and we worked with um a designer which is Cherie's friend. Was, well, Jean and I designed this thing yes. ourselves. Like we didn't hire an agency or anything, yeah. but we had one of my designer friends who's now a product manager. He helped us like think through some of the principles. Thank you, Ian. Um, I also consider myself to be a product designer. I think I have, I consider myself to have product design experience as well. Not like physical products, but digital. I mean, all product managers do to some sort of sense, but like he was- Some, a, some more than others. But he was actually a designer before he became a PM. Yeah. Like a professional. Yeah. 
So that is my rose. Okay, so for my thorn, I feel like I'm stretched pretty thin and I'm in like very much like a go, go, go mode, which I really enjoy. Like I love doing all the different things that we're doing. We have matcha, we have our podcast, we have our Japan trip coming up in May of 2025. I write a weekly newsletter, I write for Forbes, I create my own content on like Instagram. Like I have a lot of different like work streams. Your LinkedIn go. posts. I have my LinkedIn posts. I'm like growing on LinkedIn and it's it's all good things. And then on top of like those are my work work streams. I also have like a social life and then starting, you know, to take dating more seriously and then all this other parts that like, yes, it's all good things and I need to figure out how to balance it. But I do want to better prioritize like what are the things that are meaningful for me and then how do I make sure that I'm getting them done. This past weekend, I volunteered. That was amazing. I'm really glad I did that. It's once a month, but like, you know, I was even like considering maybe not doing that because I feel so busy and like maybe I should work instead, but I'm like, that's not the right trade-off. So I think getting a little bit more thoughtful about how I make my decisions and how I use my time would calm me down, but that's my thorn. I just feel like <sighs> I'm running around, you know? Yeah. I mean, I kind of feel that way too. There's like a lot going on and all of it is like interesting and valuable and we're like excited about it, but it's just a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good problem to have, I suppose. I guess for me, like, I feel like I have, I don't know if it was like a really, really conscious decision, but I definitely have been less social in the last month or so than I had been in the past year. Mm. And I also like, I kind of think you just go through phases. Like I think we said in a, a different episode, like different seasons and different reasons that was like referring to something else, but it kind of, it makes sense when it applied to like even your career too yeah yeah it's just a lot going on which is what like also is like the most fun part because I think if I felt this way in my like corporate job I would be like way more stressed out or overwhelmed but I feel like so excited about every single one of our projects that like like it doesn't feel stressful it just feels like a lot you know Mm Hmm. yeah okay now we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back we're gonna talk about how our entrepreneurship journey is going Hey everyone, quick break to share something special, Sisters Matcha. We've launched limited batches of ceremonial grade, single estate, single cultivar matcha, straight from the family farm Sheree worked on in Japan. It's pure, authentic, and crafted with intention. Head to sistersmatcha.com to grab yours before it sells out. Make matcha your daily ritual for lasting energy and focus. Okay, so time for mailbag. Mailbag. Um, which is the basis of this episode. So Kushik 100 says, you guys killed it. Thank you for sharing your experiences. Would love to see content regarding your startup process, i.e. how you guys problem solve, resources, lessons learned, etc. Thank you for your question, Kushik. Good question. Really good question. I think we've gotten a bunch of other questions like this. People are very curious as to like what our process is and yeah. like what we're doing because I can see from the outside why it would seem like a lot of different things that may seem disparate but it's all part of a broader plan totally and I love this idea of building in public like I think in the past like stealth mode was totally a thing like startups always talk about like being in stealth and like yes I understand like if you're working on like proprietary technology like you need to be in stealth mode but building in public and sharing with you guys is so exciting and really looking forward to diving in here yeah yeah so I think why don't we get started with like the startup process, since that was the first question. So I think what I would say about that is the first thing is to have a vision. And Sheree and I definitely have a vision. We actually have a very ambitious vision. A large vision. Yeah, I would say like in a nutshell, if I would just say we are planning to build the next Disney. A media empire. Yeah, the new age Disney. Um, And that's our long-term goal. And as part of that, we have like several different hypotheses that we're trying out kind of like in tandem, like all kind of going on They're at the same time. They're running in parallel. Yeah. Um, and like kind of to achieve all of that, we have like short-term goals and we have medium-term goals and all of that we've sort of mapped out and been like working towards all at the same time. And we basically are trying to ensure that like the short-term goals ladder up to the medium-term goals, ladder up to the long-term goals. Yeah. And that it all sort of like makes sense. Um, But the other thing I would say is that maybe what maybe people would be surprised by is that we are very unafraid to edit. 
the mm-hmm. strategy. Yeah, and pivot. Yeah, like even when <laughs> it seems like a major change, I guess like pivot implies a pretty big change because yeah, when we first started out, like our first project that we were expecting to work on was to make like Tiger Sisters as a reality TV show yeah. instead of a podcast. So like the podcast actually came out of like after we did a ton of research. Mm -hmm. Talking to like agents and producers in LA, understanding the landscape a little bit more about reality TV and, you know, getting an answer there. And we're like, oh, we should probably pivot away from this idea after we've gathered all this new data. Yeah. And and like also I think being sensitive to the market Mm -hmm. and being reactive to the market, right? So like, totally. I don't know. It's like, you know how how right now like every company is pitching themselves as an AI company. Gen AI. Yeah. Well, like four years ago, every company was pitching themselves as a web three company, but like today you would never pitch yourself as a web three company just as like, you know, five years ago, it wasn't as fruitful to pitch yourself as an AI company. So I think just like, like, yeah, understanding market trends also like in terms of being successful, what if we were to create a reality TV show, what would it take for us to be successful? And we did a bunch of research there. Like, do we think we can do that right now in this time and place, in this environment? Like, likely not. And so we pivoted away from that idea. And like, kind of like in a week's time, we like had to let it go and move on to like our next experiment and our next idea. And then I think like a piece of feedback that we got that was very impactful was just like, you guys should build on your strengths. You guys Mm. should leverage your strengths. And like, if Cherie already has been running a podcast for the last year Mm -hmm. and like she already has a built-in audience that is like self-created on specific platforms, then like, why wouldn't we lean into that? So I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, it's like kind of an age-old question. It's like, do you dive into the places that you're already strong Or do you like, you know, go into a new area where you're the complete newbie and you have like an advantage in that you see things in a different way that people in the space already might not be able to see. And I think we're kind of doing a little bit of both because the matcha matcha brand, Sisters Matcha, is the latter where we've never built a zero experience as somebody, as someone in another comment, like people have mentioned multiple times, like, why are you building a CBG company? Exactly. Like what you guys don't know anything about like supply chain. Like, why are you doing this? Yeah. I think going back to the larger vision of building the next Disney, I kind of want to dive into like the why for a little bit because I think it provides more context and the why is important. And so I think the ultimate vision of like where we started when we're like vision setting is that like Jean and I want to empower a billion people around the world to up level in their lives, their personal lives, their professional lives. And media is a way that we can do so, especially because Jean and I create educational content where we want to be a part of your journey as much as you are a part of our journey. And so like we were looking to like, what are the companies that are able to do that on a scale? That's not just about media, but they also have commerce in different ways. Like Disney is known obviously for their IP in their movies and all of that. And full-fledged experiences. And experiences. Like going to Disneyland. Exactly. So, but they also have like Disneyland, they have cruises. And I think, I mean, their goal in like making people happy is something that we want to do, but we want to take it a step further and not just make people happy, but really like empower them to level up in their lives. And we believe that we can do that through our content and through our different commerce channels. So that's kind of the thinking between like, how do we help the most number of people as possible and reach the most number of people as possible? Yeah. Um, but if we were to answer like super specifically, like very tactically, how do we do it? Um, we use Trello. So we have several different Trello boards and every week we review and we look at like all the things that need to be done that are like P0, P1, P2, which is priority zero, priority one, priority two. And then we have a column that's like in progress. Yeah. It's like sprint planning. Yeah. Oh, exactly. For all of you people who work in the tech world, we, Gene and I do sprint planning. We have standups, not, I mean, we have impromptu standups every day, but we do like a weekly standup on Monday. So we know what we're working on and Gene assigns me tasks and I assign her tasks sometimes and then we complete them either on our own or together. Yeah. And then we also use it as like a period of time to like sit down and actually like do work together. Yeah. Especially like 
some like sort of like annoying tasks that have to get done. Yeah. Like operational business tasks that we need to do together. Yeah. Um, because that needs to be done in addition to the creative tasks, like making this podcast. Right. And so right now, so far we have two Trello boards. One is all about podcast planning where we plan out all the episodes and the content and, um, we like schedule that schedule out. Schedule and yeah. like review it that way. And then another one is our broader like startup planning board where there's like a lot of admin and like long-term planning mm-hmm. and we also just recently started one for sisters for sisters matcha which is um more specifically like all the tasks that we have to do for sisters matcha definitely and i would say very tactically gene and i live i don't want to say live and die that's like morbid gene and i live by our calendars Like we will have a calendar event for like basically everything we do, especially because we work so closely together and then it's like nice to organize our schedules and like sync them. It's so interesting. Like a lot of my friends have commented that like it's remarkable how well we work together given that like so many things are aligned. Some of my friends are like, I love my sibling, brother or sister, but I could never imagine working with them. And they're like, we're so surprised that you and Jean are aligned on so many things. Hmm. It's really, really special, I think, in the timing of things and also, like, our view, our working styles. And maybe there might be times where we, like, disagree or, like, go back and forth a little bit, but I feel like it's actually... I agree that it's remarkable. Hmm. Maybe I'm just amazing to work with. Well, we'll have to see with your performance review coming up. (laughs) I will give you feedback then. 360. Yeah, 360. We're going to do 360 I'll collect reviews. feedback from me, me, and myself. <laughs> me, myself, and I. Um, I want to go back to your comment about stealth is dead. Yeah. Stealth mode. Goodbye, stealth mode. That's in the past. Hello, building in public. Yeah. I, I really like that. I me thought too. that was kind of a hot take. I mean, obviously, it's a generalization, you know. Like, some things should be built in stealth mode. It... I mean, I was going to say like pharmaceutical, like if you're creating a new like pharmaceutical and it's like super proprietary, but then again, maybe some pharmaceuticals should not be built in stealth mode. Maybe that knowledge should be shared. So bad example, but you know, like so many startups who are creating like the next like innovation in AI, whatever, like they want to build in stealth mode, but I think it's, it's actually not just startups. So like for me, Mm, this like building in public is really a challenge and it's very outside my comfort zone as are many things that we're doing these days because from for my background like obviously Goldman was all about like the firm like there was so like we were scared to death of accidentally ever saying something in like the elevator you have that rule right like you're not supposed to talk about work in the elevator at Goldman because you don't know who could be in there like a client a reporter like competitor competitor so like we were always like so scared to death and we're always like Oh, the firm, like, et cetera. So that was like my first experience, like my first experience out of um, college. And then even at Snap, we had quite like a... Siloed? Yeah, like we were super siloed and like very like closed door projects. So there were a lot of projects that I worked on that were even secret within the company. And like only specific teams like knew about it, only specific very specific people had access to it. Yeah. Um, Apple is the same way. Apple is right. known to be very secretive. Exactly. So we had like a lot of that culture, especially towards the beginning, um, even even today, but like especially around projects that were like hardware related and like True. things that are Extra more sensitive. Yeah. Things that are more like proprietary and secretive. So for me, it's a major departure, but mm. I am already starting to see the benefits of it, Yes, which is that like when you put yourself out there and like put what you're working on out there, it's actually really surprising. Like people want to help. Yeah. People want to be involved. They and, want to engage. Yes. And I think like, it's not purely altruistic. It's not like people want to help just because they want to help. It's because they think what you're doing is like interesting and they like want to be involved, which is kind of like, honestly, my own experience too, Mm. because I advise these three different startups. Yeah. And like, I think what they're doing is really interesting. Like I want to be a part of it. Like I want to help them because I want to see what they're building, like be really big in the world and like be successful. So that's one thing I've been pleasantly surprised by so far there are many benefits to building building in public public. yeah i think another benefit of building in public is that you're able to 
talk to your audience mm-hmm. and get feedback so quickly. Like Jean and I read all of the comments. So like we see the DMs, we see people commenting on this design, like asking questions about it. On There's a lot of comments on the color about this. Blue is controversial, Blue guys. Blue is so controversial. They're like, some Yikes. comments that I've seen <laughs> is that like, oh, blue is a color, uh, a negative comment is like blue is the color of a lot of skincare stuff. Like this doesn't look like matcha to me. So like I don't yeah. want it to be blue. Well, or or someone was like blue is like historically an appetite suppressant color. Huh? And like Someone said that? Yeah. You didn't see that comment? No. I was like, guys, we're not McDonald's. Like we're not, we're not going to do like red and yellow McDonald's because <laughs> we want you to like eat more. We're not trying to like force it down your throat like we want you to like opt into it yeah well there's also a positive comment about the blue where blue has like a very positive association in the sense that like blue is a color that can be many many things Mm. Um, blue is a color that is very versatile and can be many things for many people so yeah yeah we've we see the comments and i think that's good about building in public is that we're able to get a wide variety of opinions from the people who we would be selling to so our customers it's like really important to have that dialogue and i think a lot of companies that are working in stealth miss out on that i think the other cool part like taking that a little bit further about building in public is that also just our friends know what we're doing. And like, this is kind of like one of the first times that I've really started to see like the value of our network, Mm. AKA our friends, which is that just that like, I feel like so many of my friends are just like brilliant in like so many different ways and are just like so talented. And like, because they know what I'm doing, it's really easy to just like jump into a conversation with them and like be like, oh, like I've been thinking about this. Like, what do you think? And like, I feel like we, we get so, I get so much, I get so much inspiration from our friends. Yeah. And like, I learn so much from them. And like, I feel like every few conversations, like they, it, it turns into something where I'm like, oh, this is something that could really change like the trajectory of our entire company, what we're working on. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like, it's amazing to have that network. The conversations come so easily because they see what we're posting. They're just like, how's matcha sisters matcha going, you know? And then because they're brilliant and like smart in like their own ways, they'll bring like a nugget of wisdom. We're like, oh, we didn't think about it that way. Yeah. We should. And then like, we'll be like, oh my God, we need to incorporate this. Yeah. It's like every conversation can be a big brain conversation, but like in the best way where it's like really fun because like we're obviously passionate about what we're building. And like when our friends like bring their lens and they're like genius to it, even for just like, you know, like a 30 minute conversation, it's like having like an infinite amazing like board of advisors yeah who have like thousands of years of like job expertise across like all of them especially in different fields too yeah because we have friends across so many different industries who bring different like wisdom to what we're doing yeah and it's also fun it's also kind of fun to like realize that like your friends have even different skills than you like realize that they had Mm. you know like when we were talking to my friend yesterday i was like wait, you're like an amazing marketer. Like I had no idea because like the capacity I had been working with him in was like product. We were both heads of product. And I was like, what? You are so good at marketing. Mm. Like just like, uh, it's it's so fun to discover. I love it's it. It's really fun. I love it. Especially talking about our own thing. It's yeah. just like, we're so much more passionate about it. And like, I, I, I also really love it as well. I would say a downside to building in public that we've, like run into a couple of times trolls trolls sorry to preempt you there but who, i mean i wasn't even gonna say that but yes trolls <laughs> sometimes like on our co- on our content but like that's just the nature that's the beast of it and you know i've been dealing with online trolls for the last four years so it's fine um haters don't get her down though yeah the haters just power her even more haters are engagement i try to tell myself that but um <laughs> i would say honestly that one of the negatives is like building in public but not there's like a line. You need to like protect yourself and fortify your company while also sharing what you're doing because there are some trolls. For example, like we announced like the name of Sisters Matcha. Oh yeah. And oh, I this was... <laughs> and I hadn't even like built the Instagram page yet and like I probably should have. Now lesson learned, I will. But like someone created like a Sisters Matcha account that said new, like and my guess is that they saw that I announced it and they tried to take the Instagram name of it, you know? And like it was just like stuff like that where 
I don't know. It's just weird. Womp womp. Same thing happened with like another naming convention that we tried to do where we looked it up online. Domain was totally free. We created a LinkedIn post. Like we didn't buy it. We were going to buy it in like two days. We created a LinkedIn (laughs) post like announcing the name of something. And then like two days later, the domain was taken and was like going to be sold for like $200. And we're like, what the hell? Yeah. You know, so I think it's like finding the balance between like building in public in real time, but while still like protecting yourself as a company and being like wise enough to know that there are like weirdo, like shady people who are trying to like outsmart you in some ways. Yeah. That's something we hadn't really, clearly we hadn't really like considered that or like planned around it. Yeah. Narcs. (laughs) It's okay though. I guess like if we can learn our lesson for like $200 or whatever, then it's, it's not that big of a deal. Worth it. Yeah. We did try to buy the domain of like another of like sisters.com or something. And someone was trying to sell it to us for like three quarters of a million dollars. <laughs> I was like, hello, you can keep the domain name. That was insane. Yeah. Anyways, like stuff like that that's behind the scenes where you're like what is going on in building this company next we're gonna take a break and when we come back we're gonna talk about the lessons that we've learned hey guys quick break to let you know that we now have merch on sistersmatcha.com we have sweatshirts and t-shirts that we designed ourselves go check it out and please rate us five stars on spotify and apple podcasts these ratings are so important for the distribution and survival of tiger sisters podcast thank you for your support welcome back (laughs) welcome back and so back to the original question is like what are some of the lessons that we've learned we've been working on this startup for the last few months Jean what are some of the lessons that you've gleaned yeah I think the first one and I kind of alluded to this earlier is to not be afraid to change course especially early on and because we act we are so early like we've only launched for like a few months like two months three months yeah like very we're very early on and when I think back about like different companies that I've been working very closely with, like there are many companies that would have been much better off if they had pivoted or like if they had adjusted more early yeah. on. So like, I think that's something that I'm actually surprised by like how fluidly you and I have both been um, able to do that. And like, because I feel like a lot of people take it really, really hard when they have to make major adjustments Mm. so i think something that people say is strong convictions loosely held which is basically like you want to have your beliefs but not be afraid to take in new information and make changes and edits where where needed honestly i feel like i felt a lot of pressure in the corporate world to stay on course because there were so many more things at stake in terms of like aligning people and like yeah, having your boss tell you something true. and then you have to like manage your the entire politics the politics and also like how people feel morale like if we had like a team of engineers i think it would be like a lot harder to like move the boat as quickly because we are moving things when it's just you and we just i just have one engineer <laughs> we just i have the to manage cto i have to manage myself but like i mean that it's true though we do have to manage our own emotions but that's it and that's like not easy but like easier yes because we have each other and like we know each other so well and how we can kind of do that and like help each other in those ways it's so hard when you have like an organization i think the other lesson i've learned is that it's okay to be working on these several different initiatives at the same time and to be like testing out these different hypotheses because i'm kind of very like in the mode right now and i was mentioning this to you yesterday that i think like all of the things that we're working on are for a reason. Mm -hmm. Like even if one of them doesn't turn out to be like a major like aspect of our company going forward, like we are going to learn something so invaluable from it. And it's going to turn into something that never would have happened had it not been for us doing the first thing. I agree. I totally agree with that statement. So I feel like It may seem like, because even outside of Sisters Matcha and outside of the podcast, we are doing a lot of different things. So like we're speaking at conferences, we are going and like reporting at, you're going to be a reporter at a conference. Like, yeah, I'm a writer for Forbes. Forbes. I attended an event last week that I'm writing like an article on. Like, yeah, I'm an active investor. Like we are doing a lot of things. And sometimes I feel like when we talk to our friends, they're like, what is going on? I'm like, 
<laughs> I just tell people I'm multi hyphenate. I'm like, do you really? Yeah, because it is kind of hard. I I mean, I wonder if we need a better way to like package it and brand model it. slash actress. I need a way to like package and brand it, maybe. But like, you know, we're also like doing a lot with our trip to Japan that's coming yes. up. Yes. Like it's hard to community kind of, building. Community building. I do think it's kind of hard to explain. When I talked to my friends, I was like, we have our podcast. I have my Instagram. I'm writing for Forbes. We're going to Japan. We have a matcha brand. Okay, but like in my mind, in our mind, it, it all makes all sense. It all makes sense. It all works together. And I think like I'm leaning more into this. At first I was not super comfortable with it, but like you remember when you interviewed me on your other podcast, Sheree's Corner? Yeah. Now now since now on its, it's last season, up. now yes. wrapped up. Um, but took me a long time to get on that podcast, guys. Finally. <laughs> Finally, I was asked on as a guest. Yes. But one of the things that you said was you were like, after I described like all the things that mm. I've worked on in my like history and my career, you were like, oh, it sounds like you have always been working on the cutting edge. And I was like, yeah, like that's pretty accurate. And I feel like that's what's happening again here. Because like what we're building is this sort of new format of a company and of an enterprise that is not like, it doesn't have an acronym that goes along with it, right? Mm. We can't just be like, oh, it's B2B SaaS. Like it's not easily understandable because it's an entirely new entity that I think is going to be the basis of like many more companies to come. Yeah. It's never been done before. It's never been done, babes. It's never been done. Yeah. But so like, I think the different ways that we're building like a new language around it too, right? So like us saying things like, oh, our company is a content to commerce company or us saying like we are building and monetizing IP brands and community. Like that's all kind of like new. I've never really heard other people put it that way. I actually don't think there's that many people who are doing it this way. I like think to creators or actually influencers like Emma Chamberlain or even Mr. Beast mm-hmm. who do it. And I don't exact. I think they're adjacent, but I don't exactly think they're doing it the way that we're doing it. Yeah. Like it's different flavors for sure. It's different flavors because Emma Chamberlain definitely, she has her vlog, she has her podcast. She brings you along on her life, but it's not really like so much her business aspect as it is more the lifestyle. Yeah. Whereas like we're doing building in public and that is part of our business. Yeah. Um, and Mr. Beast obviously like has his content and he has his like game shows and everything, but it's not like the everyday like minutia right that, like, his is much more about. of like a grander uh, scale of production his is well i would say his is much more of like a media company but more of like media on new platforms it i think it's much easier to like understand and much more straightforward especially like the direction he's gone now yeah um so so it's scary that we're doing like something that's never been done before because like what the hell but it's also just like oh my god i feel like there is no playbook and we're writing the playbook. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's so invigorating. And like, it's cool when you have so much conviction in something and it's your own thing. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like that is very, very rare because there are times when I feel like I've worked on projects in the past and these are, this is when I've been like the most fired up and like we'll be working like, you know, 100 hours a week or something like on on a, a work project when it's like, you have so much conviction in it and you feel a lot of ownership. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is that times like a million. (laughs) Yeah. It's really special in that way because I've worked on my content for the last like four years, almost five years, but it's like only been my content, never really the business side. I've done brand deals, but like this is like our own business on top of that content. So for me, it's a completely new flavor as well. Yeah. Yeah exciting yeah you okay and we actually have a second mailbag question that i think we can touch on pretty quickly so seven summer grapes asks how exciting can you share a bit more about the biggest difference in building a cpg versus software product besides the product development process obviously what did you not expect what skills you learned prior that's going to set you or your product apart okay for this question i have three points I would say the first thing that we did not expect was um, physical injuries. Oh my God. (laughs) My lip. My lip is physically injured. I was, quick story, I was taping together one of these prototype things and I had like a piece of tape and I needed to align it. I put the tape in my mouth because you know, you're just like, you wanted to hold it on something. Put the tape in my mouth. 
took off the tape, it ripped off a piece of my skin on my inner lip. And I was bleeding and I was freaking out. It was, it's actually. She was actually so traumatized, guys. She was so, so traumatized. I like waxed, accidentally waxed the inside of my lip (laughs) with this piece of like scotch tape. Never do that. Do not put tape around. It's like actually a PSA. It's like, you know, when you see those PSAs on TikTok that you like send to all your friends that are like, don't drive with like a claw Claw clip on the back of your head. This was a PSA. Never put tape around sensitive skin. I don't know (laughs) if you're doing that otherwise, but literally my lip was like bleeding and like now is still healing and I'm just quite unhappy. Okay, I just had to give her a chance to get that out. Thank you. That was, but it is true. It It almost made it as my thorn. Almost made it as my thorn. I didn't want to draw attention to it, but yet here we are. (laughs) Okay. So that's the first one. Um, The second one, I would say, I don't know, this is kind of obvious, but turnaround time. Mm. right like software is so freaking fast like there are times that i would have an idea for like an augmented reality lens and then the next day it would be made and then the day after that it would be in the app and the day after that it would have been used by like billions of billions of times billions billions well the Um, thing is like so far it's been fast turnaround because we've been working on the digital side we've been creating this logo so whenever gina and i have a new idea we can change it now that this is being made into like the physical canister like the times for wait are going to be much longer now is the turnaround time now is the turn so now we're waiting which they're creating a sample to see what it looks like yeah 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 so that's just different because I don't know, when you work in software, you're always like in the mix. Like you can always be like editing and changing things all right. the time. Fix not that you not that you necessarily should be. It's not you, always the best but you practice. Can. But you can be. Um and then I would say the third thing I've noticed that's different, third thing I've noticed already is obviously scaling. Mm. Right? For like software, you just build it one time and then you can scale indefinitely. Right. Um, versus like this, it's obviously a physical product. And the way that we chose to do it is we are actually making, even within the category of that physical product, an ultra premium version Mm -hmm. of that. So the fact that it's single cultivar, single estate, um, ceremonial, Mm -hmm. like all of that, it's literally from a single family farm. Yeah. So like we are obviously constrained by the operational capabilities yes. of the family farm, which has three like three non farm empl- non farmer employees. Yeah. So, so that part is very different. But I actually think that almost like I don't want to say subconsciously because I don't want to like not give ourselves credit for this. But like the fact that we decided to go ultra premium with it actually fits really well and the fact that we're doing it all small batch yes it actually fits our approach really well, well. it fit, it fits our approach and also i know there and are ethos there's a lot of like influencers who have created matcha brands themselves and i think a lot of it is centered on like their love for matcha which gene and i have obviously because we're creating this brand but i think behind it too there's like we it's small batch, small family farm. Like we're connecting with this like one family who owns this one farm. Like I've seen some influencer like behind the scenes of their like matcha videos and how they process their matcha in Japan. But like it's these like giant warehouses and factories and yeah. that's not what we're doing at all. She and, would never. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a problem if we want to scale to like 3 million canisters of matcha. Right now we have 300 that we're going to smell. St- we're going to sell small batch. We're going to smell. She's going to sell she- seashells by the seashore. 300 <laughs> that we want to sell small batch. But like, yeah. So like it's. <laughs> what, what was that again? Sell small batch. We're going to sell 300 that we're going to sell small batch. Exactly. So yeah, it, I don't know. It's it's special. It is. It does go hand in hand with our ethos of who we are and what we want our company to represent. Yeah. So th- those are the things that are different. I would also say like one way we're trying to differentiate ourselves because like there are a bunch of matcha brands out there is the storytelling. Mm, It's like so important to understand like Jean and I believe like what you're buying and what is the story behind it because like people now you you um what's it called with your dollars you support I I don't know you support with your dollars. It's like you you like opt in with your dollars. You like express yourself with what you buy. Like yes. even like 
everyday consumable purchases are now like what I consider to be like ego expressive. Mm -hmm. Like every time you make a purchase, it's saying thing, something about yourself, right? Like exactly. Like one thing, one way Sheree and I've been sort of like jokingly referring to it is just like the yassification of like so many different categories. Mm -hmm. So like 10 years ago, if you ask someone like, hey, what's your favorite olive oil? Like nobody would have an answer because nobody knew olive oil brands. Right. And now there's so many that are like very heavily branded, beautifully designed, artisanal. artisanal like you understand the, um, they have varietals too. Yes. My favorite is Picul. But of course you have a favorite <laughs> olive oil varietal. varietal. Um, but that's happened. That's taken like 10 years to yeah. start to like come to the fruition. And like it's actually happening to a lot of different categories because – also, I think because, okay, this is maybe a hot take and it's like very new, but also things are generally more expensive to buy now. Yeah. So like... Inflation. Yeah. So I feel like people maybe want to be more intentional oh. about even purchases that used to be very just like no thought given to it. Yeah. I think, I mean, there is like a very intentional consumerism now. And even though like... We would love it if you would buy our matcha because of us and like support us as creators. I would say like in addition to that, like who we are as creators is like working and telling the story of the small family farm that I worked on and like what is the history of tea farming in Japan. Like just very briefly, like the farm that I worked on, like surrounding it, like those tea fields have been owned by like seventh, eighth generation tea farmers. There's a huge problem in many Asian countries and in Japan of aging population. And so many of these tea farmers are, you know, aging out and they don't have people to take over their farms because their kids are living in the cities nowadays. It's like this whole like national geographic, like, you know, esque type of view mm -hmm. into like the tea farming industry, which is like a huge historic part of Japan. Yeah. And that's like a story that like interests me deeply deeply interests yeah my and we haven't even side. talked about that at all ever like basically like not to put too fine of a point on it but like by buying this matcha you are supporting literally like financially supporting the regeneration of matcha tea farming in of, like, japan small yes tea small communities family owned yeah in japan and that's like no one talks which is a about, dying practice and no one's talking about that and like yes you can buy this like new fancy type of matcha that like some influencers created or you know some brand has created but like the story behind ours like i love like connecting and isn't saying that it's the national geographic point of view you know what i'm trying to say it's like kind of like the documentary aspect mm, of it yeah i get what you're saying where yeah. it's like the academic the history like the learning about like where does this come from that is just yeah. like so cool to me yeah. not only with matcha but like whenever like i buy like a piece of pottery or like even a piece of clothing especially when you're like traveling to a new place like mm -hmm. i just want to know about its origins mm -hmm. and the historical context in which this was created yeah who created it it's just like i like that i don't know i think you're not alone in that i think that more and more so people of our generation more so your generation it are like very invested in the like provenance and like yes. the heritage of every single piece of clothing they wear like every piece of like you know skin like everything that they consume like people are much more intentional than than ever before which is very different from like i feel like my generation is like kind of the like forever 21 like zara inditex I like mean, fast fashion like to be to be like devil's advocate though like i still see still see that aspect because like shein is massive here and people know exactly what shein's doing and that's like fast fashion foundation yeah so i don't really know how to like grok like this growing trend of like young people being very conscientious but then also other like the masses still wanting the mass-produced stuff. I think it's not one or the other. I think people are doing both at the same time. Like, it, mm. it just depends on your your wallet, right? So, like, people, mm. they're buying Shein, but if they if they could afford it, would they buy, like, Loewe? Like, would they buy... Like, they're buying Shein for clothes, but then they're buying, like, one really, like, special pair of shorts from, like, Lisa Says Ga or something like that. <laughs> I don't know that brand. Well, yeah. So, like... 
I think like they're choosing or they're like going to their favorite coffee or matcha shop and like buying like a seven dollar matcha like yeah. every week because that is says something about them but they can't afford to do the equivalent when it comes to like a full outfit hmm. right that's interesting it's like it can take place in like certain parts of their daily habits but maybe not all parts yeah 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 people are still i think like graduating into that but and then also that i think that's why like vintage shopping has come back into fashion like mm-hmm. so hard mm-hmm. because it's like a way to do that and a way to like have automatically like a story and like a history to your outfit and your clothes in a way to be unique but at a more affordable price point point. and there's also like a little bit of like clout that comes with vintage shopping as well in that like it is good for the environment it is good to reuse and buy like used clothing so I, yeah, it's interesting. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode of Tiger Sisters. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And we would so appreciate it if you could share this episode with someone who might find it helpful. Thanks so much. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.